about can be as simple as standing up, sharing a story, and breaking into small groups. And you guys, there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of us in the church, I think in the church sometimes, we're really not good at placing people in the areas of their gifts. That's a whole different workshop, you know? It's not that you got the wrong people, it's just sometimes the right people are serving in their areas in the wrong place, you know? We just gotta, you know, we just gotta get it right, you know? So anyway, um, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about how is it that we can, um, you know, better communicate to this generation that honestly, their attention span is just getting lighter and lighter. There's kind of this myth out there that we've got to have these big, long talks because we think, I want to be deep. I really want to get into scripture. I don't want to be shallow. I don't want to be servicey. So I got to talk as long as Tim Keller and Andy Stanley. You know? I'm going to be 40 minutes. Now, sometimes we have people speaking 40 minutes and people speaking four. You know? And the thing that's crazy is sometimes those shorter talks are even more effective. Like, here's one of my most favorite talks from a U.S. president. <laughs> That's right. In less than an hour, an aircraft from here will join others from around the world. And you will be launching the largest aerial battle in the history of mankind. Mankind, that word should have a new meaning for all of us today. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. We will be united in our common interest. Perhaps it's fate that today is the 4th of July, and you will once again be fighting for our freedom. Not from tyranny, oppression, or persecution, but from annihilation. We're fighting for our right to live, to exist. And should we win the day, the 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday, but as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night, we will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive.
so they're all talking. So they actually brought up this game they did where they had a wood chipper up front, and they're like, you pick it, we chip it. And they put watermelons and stuff in there. And I'm sitting there like, this is amazing. And kids go like this, they're like, yeah, uh -huh. and they're talking, I'm like, oh, well, I'm in trouble. I started telling stories. And it's amazing how stories still capture a generation. Matter of fact, sometimes you see the best speakers. I'll never forget when uh, some of you guys might remember in the old YS days of Mike Gack now. It's an amazing guy, amazing speaker. Mike Gack is a new pastor in the 70s. And he brought Mike out. And uh, not a lot of people know this, but he brought him out. And Mike is phenomenal. Now, my dad said we had these, all these kids on the ski trip, and they were bouncing off the walls. We literally practically locked the doors and threw Mike up on stage. And he goes, and Mike hated us because it just, we couldn't keep these kids' attention. It was so hard. And when that happens, I've been in that situation. Sometimes you're going to tell the story, and then when you wrap up the story, you literally go, you know, and that, and then the parents said. You know, whatever, you know, you finish the story. That's a good story, brother. Anyway, you know, we said, what could a parrot say? But you finish the story, and when you start to go, and that's just like in John 4, when you see kids going, eh, and tune it out. <laughs> Wait, I said John 4, and you're tuning out. You know, it's crazy how you see that. Uh, so it's weird because in the social media world, you know, where you know, everybody's throwing up their, you know, social media, yeah, see that slide? I threw that up there. You know, you're throwing up your, you know, your social media things so that way, you know, people will take pictures of your teaching and post it just for a cheap retweet. What a crazy world we live in. <laughs> That's bizarre if someone were to do that. I mean, what if we step, you know, Go ahead, give me time, right? Down. Anyway, so there you go. Uh, in a tent, when attention pans, the fans are going so short, we might consider become more strategic about capturing and keeping attention. And you guys, I can't emphasize this more. Um, why not keep it short? Now, some people are saying, Jonathan, do you think we can really make an impact in a few minutes? Or are you watering down the gospel? You know, and it's not going to be deep. If it's only a few minutes, you know? Are you not, I mean, this, so let's look at some really, some really powerful um, examples of communication. Watch this. In Texas, they lynch Negroes. My teammates and I saw a man struggle by his neck and set on fire. We drove through a lynch mob, pressed our faces against the floorboard. I looked at my teammates. I saw the fear in their eyes. And worse, the shame. What was this Negro's crime? That he should be hung without trial in a dark forest filled with fog? Was he a thief? Was he a killer? Or just a Negro? Was he a sharecropper? A preacher? Were his children waiting up for him? And who are we to just lie there and do nothing? 
No matter what he did, the mob was the criminal. But the law did nothing. Just left us wondering, why? My opponent says, nothing that erodes the rule of law can be moral. But there is no rule of law in the Jim Crow South. Not when Negroes are denied housing, turned away from schools, hospitals, and not when we are lynched. St. Augustine said, an unjust law is no law at all. Which means I have a right, even a duty, to resist. With violence or civil disobedience. You should pray I choose the latter. Speech only a couple minutes long. I want to hear from you guys. Uh, how did the speaker gain their interest? What were some of the things pause. he used? Yep, long, long pause. What else? How did he gain their interest right away? Throw your hand up so I can call you so you can all hear it. Yeah. Good opening line in, in Texas, they lynched Negroes. I think this is the opening line. Yeah. Yeah, you say that. What's it? Eye contact. Big time. Yeah, absolutely. What else do you use? What else do you know? Yeah. Very personal. Personal personal experience. Personal thing that happened to him. And man, he had everybody right there. Uh, you know, uh, what are some of the tools you saw him throughout the speech use? What are some of the things you noticed? Anyway. Yeah. You tell the story. Story, definitely. What else? Use a quote. And if you guys saw the movie Great Barriers, he's the researcher. So he was constantly researching and looking at it. So he you know, pulls out his Augustine quote. Yeah. What else? Other stuff you saw that you thought was good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Westerns and drama. Very good with his voice. A little emotional, even. You know? Good stuff, yeah. Build tension by asking questions. Yeah, absolutely. We had a great inspirational song joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Background music. Right. Which is why we play Just As I Am during every altar call. Yes. The song is on. What's Just As I Am? He was very direct and to the point. Direct and to the point. Absolutely short. We're talking a couple of minutes, and again, you think, I mean, honestly, I take that youth group talk any day. Yeah. But just to add to this point, he actually, um, by using the word, you better go by choosing the latter, he spoke to every single person individually. Yeah. He ended on a threat. <laughs> <laughs> What was this one doll quote? Did anybody write it down in the leadership meeting? Somebody said something about what Chuck Swindoll said. At the end of every message, we want to compel them to uh, to take an act, to take a, some, I forget what it was. I didn't write down, somebody should have wrote it down. It really good. Uh, uh, okay, watch this. Today's speaker is going to be Waylon. So if you come to these meetings, you have to.
and I was out there on them corners, not a pot to piss in, and anyone that ever knew me or loved me cussing my name, you know what I told myself? I said, Waylon, you're doing good. <laughs> I surely did. I, I thought I was God's own drug addict, and if God hadn't meant for me to get high, he wouldn't have made being high so much like perfect. Now, I know I got one more high left in me, but I doubt very seriously if I have one more recovery. So if there's anybody out there that sees that bottom coming up at them, I'm here to talk sense. I don't care who you are, what you've done, or who you've done it to. If you're here, so am I. For sure. I love it. And we also like kind of, he switched it up on him. He's all this and bad, bad, bad. And I thought, well, then you're doing pretty good. Like, you know? So really good stuff. What else? What else did you see? What, what kind of, in fact, that question I always ask is what tools did you see him using? Yeah. His, uh, he said his life was on the line, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that line. He goes, I might, I, I know I've got another high left, but I don't know if I have another recovery. Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff. I got a kid that's a drug addict. Uh, that, that's, that's hard stuff to watch. I mean, that, that's crazy. What else we see here? Oh. Yeah, sit dead here. Now, he was, he got, oh, I'm sorry. Those he, he was real, he wasn't good naked. Very real, not making excuses at all. Just laying out there. Yeah. I'm glad like he spoke in a way that wasn't different than what normally people want to do. Yeah. He spoke in a, in a sort of way. Yeah, he, did, he, did, he didn't just lay it out. He almost kind of. It was almost like lyrics, you know, sometimes the way he told that story. He was good. He was an articulate speaker. It's funny. He didn't sound necessarily articulate, but he was pretty articulate. Um, what if, any other things you know, Sarah, about that? Did you know? Yeah, go ahead. He was willing to offer his support. He was going he was gonna offer it, it, it at the end, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. He offered to help. I love it because it really was an altar call. It was a drug rehab altar call, so to speak. He goes, if any of you feels like you're like this, you can talk with me. You know, here. And how many times do you get at youth group? Sometimes you don't do the necessarily, okay, let me lead you through the prayer, but we're here to talk with you if you want to talk, right? It was great. And it was so cool because you heard this story. And I tell you, if a lot of us are asking, how can I engage young people today? You guys, one of the powerful tools, and those guys came in late, the first thing we were talking about here is that we, don't, we aren't all gifted speakers, but all of us can at least learn to teach with a bare minimum being sharing a story and bringing up to small groups. And I think a lot of us could learn how to minimize our monologue and maximize our dialogue. Sometimes we're, we're lucky enough to have a gifted speaker God bless us with well, a speaker that we've got that, that's, wow, this guy can actually, you know, really go, you know, when I speak to junior high kids in camp, they're out probably 25 minutes, you know? And, and, and it's funny, and I meet people that it's not their gifting, and they'll go 45 minutes, you know? And they lost them at three, you know? Yeah, and it's painful. Kids are like, stop! Please! You know? And so, but the thing is, what if we did a talk for 10 minutes and then small groups for like 45? You guys, this is a design, we designed one of my earlier books that came out was 10-minute talks. Remember, I brought with me more 10-minute talks. The whole design of this book is talk, scripture, one point. Divided small groups. And that's right, I have small group questions. You can use Everything I write now for young people, uh, I love this one. A lot of Christians were like, what's this? I better find a chair to cover. The zombie apocalypse is survival guide for teenagers. <laughs> you know what this book is? It's Story, discussion questions, and scripture. We need to start thinking about how we can engage a generation with a short attention span. And I tell you something, a uh, little plug for my next session. I'm talking about small groups. If you didn't hear that, it's the same. I actually taught that one last year, too. So if you got last year, you got it. But it's talking about how can we effectively 
bring out the conversation for young people, make them feel connected, make them feel noticed, make them feel heard, and small groups is such a powerful way to do that. And when it comes to talking, that's a way that we, we should absolutely look towards using that. But some people are saying, well, John, I really want to give this, this speaking thing a try. Um, you know, what's that actually look like? So one of the questions I would ask is, well, how did Jesus do it? And if we look at Jesus' teaching throughout Scripture, what we see, or at least what the disciples remembered, <laughs> right? You know, because, I mean, basically they were writing this down later, was that Jesus constantly utilized the story. And a lot of us will probably recognize that very good speakers are speakers who often will use a story. Now, training sessions can be different than that. Sometimes training sessions will be, you know, bringing through, you know, evidence and teaching how to do certain things. But I think when we're speaking on youth group night, speaking church Sunday morning, stories are powerful. So let's look at what this talks about. I mean, I'm, what, I'm going to look at because Jesus himself, I tell you, he used stories as a teaching tool to large crowds. He had a crowd gathering, like, for example, uh, Luke 8. When a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town to town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow seed. And as he scattered the seed, see, he starts the story. That was a large crowd. Um, he also used them to confront people. Uh, here's Luke 7. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching what kind of woman she is, uh, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money. I mean, Jesus constantly told stories. He sent them to answer questions. Uh, Luke 10. The, uh, excuse me. Uh, wait, wait. Here we are. Answer questions. Uh, Luke 10. He wanted to justify himself, so we asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down the street. <laughs> <laughs> and he found a natural rock. It starts to get almost comical. He used to explain himself. Uh, Luke 15. But the first thing Jesus was uh, that this man welcomed sinners and eats with them. You know, or today's day, first would be like, yo, yo, he's hanging out with thought thoughts. And, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe for five of you got that. Uh, then Jesus spoke in a parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and he's one of them. Does he not leave the 99? You know, uh, you guys, I mean, the disciples probably hated it. And sometimes, you know, Peter was probably like, Jesus, where's the bathroom? Two men were walking. <laughs> Our storytellers, and a lot of what we need to do is master the story. Let me give you some tips on how to master the story. If you're going to do a YouTube talk or something like that, start becoming a story collector. And that means as you go through life, write it down. Um, I used to, do, I, I used to you know, talk to kids on campus at least once a week, if not twice a week, because one of them was running high school and junior high thing. And so I constantly was in search for a story as an example. And every time, like, you know, my kid was a toddler, like, you know, I would tell him to stop doing something, then he would do something, and he'd knock down, and he'd cry, and I'm like, yeah, that's my example for this week. You know, I mean, I'm literally, I'm writing down. I'll never forget when I was sitting there, and my cat had been torturing my dog for the longest time, and my dog finally had enough, and chased the cat, pinned him in the corner, and, like, grabbed his head, and went over like this, and I was sitting there laughing. <laughs> and then I stopped it. 45 minutes later. And, uh, but, uh, but it was crazy because you're like, he doesn't like two hours, he doesn't like cats. But the thing is, uh, so, so I, I, uh, I, was, I was watching later and his whiskers broke off. And my friend who's this cat lover goes, uh, you know, wait, wait, is that an inside cat or an outside cat? I said, it's an inside cat. It tortures us all the time. And he goes, oh, well, don't let it outside. I go, why? He goes, because cats use their whiskers to tell whether they're in danger or not. And a cat without whiskers can literally crawl into a pipe or something like that. And none of you realize it's in danger. He's stuck and, and cats will die like that. And I, so I went home and let my cat go. <laughs> 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 uh, my wife did. But uh, so, uh, and it was, uh, it's, I know, it's horrible. But uh, the thing is, you know, I was, as soon as he said that, I'm like, that's it. And I have used that so many times talking with thousands of junior high kids. I'll tell this funny story, they're laughing, this and that. I get to the whiskers part, I tell a story, wow, it's amazing, he doesn't even realize he's naked. I go, isn't it funny that there's a creature out there that loses all sensitivity to what's going on around it and would not even realize it's in danger? Isn't it amazing that there's a creature out there that loses all sensitivity to what's going on around it and doesn't even realize it's in danger? 
and you can always hear it and drop. And I'm like, we think we're foolproof. We think we're Superman. We think, oh, this is going to affect me. And I go right in and talk about it. And it's, so I use that all the time to talk about sin. We need to, as we encounter stories, we need to start collecting stories right now. That might be stories from our own life. So if you see something funny happen, because I'll tell you something, young people love humor. So if there's something that you ever notice that you're telling your friends a story and your friends are laughing, go, ah, is there anything that this story would illustrate? Because this could be a good one to use. And you want to file it. You want to write that down. Keep that story from your own life. Um, for example, Japanese submarines slammed two torpedoes into our side chief. <laughs> He's coming back from the island of Tinian to Lady. He just delivered the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb. Eleven hundred men went into the water. The vessel went down in twelve minutes. Didn't see the first shot for about a half an hour. Tiger, thirteen footer. You know, you know that when you're in the water, chief. Tell by looking from the dorsal to the tail. What well, we didn't know was our bomb mission had been so secret, no distress signal had been sent. <laughs> they didn't even list us overdue for the week. Very first light, Chief. The sharks come cruising. So we formed ourselves into tight groups. You know, it's kind of like old squares in the battle, like you see in a calendar, like the Battle of Waterloo, and the idea was, Chuck comes the nearest man up, and he starts bounding and hollering and screaming, and sometimes the shark would go away. Sometimes he wouldn't go away. Sometimes that shark, he looks right in you, right into your eyes. You know the thing about a shark, he said, Lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white and then... Oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The ocean turns red and despite all the pounding and the hollering, they all come in and rip you to pieces. <laughs> Nobody in that first dawn lost a hundred men. I don't know how many sharks, maybe a thousand. I don't know how many men the average six an hour. On Thursday morning, Chief, I bumped into a friend of mine, Herbie Robinson from Cleveland. Baseball player, Bozen's man. I thought he was asleep, but he still would have wake him up. Bobbed up and down in the water, just like a cat top. Upended. Well, he'd been bitten in half below the waist. Noon the fifth day, Mr. Lucari, Lockheed Ventura. So she swung in low and he saw us too. The young pilot luck. Younger than Mr. Hooper anyway, he saw us and he come in low and three hours later a big fat PBY comes down and starts to pick us up. You know, that was the time I was most frightened, waiting for my turn. I'll never put on a nice jacket again. Great movie, Jaws. Uh, stories like that, especially if you've ever had somebody share a life or death experience like that, it's amazing how compelling a story like that can be from your own life. Um, so I encourage you, if you, if, as you write stuff down, as you get to it, start looking for what are stories that you guys have to encounter. But they don't have to be your own stories. The power of it is, don't feel bad. If you hear a good story, you can use other people's stories. And by the way, when I say use other stories, say, my friend Frank tells the story of when he was, and you tell the story. And I tell you, people do that all the time. Now, what's not good is when people do that and they say it, as their own. We actually had a pastor once, believe it or not, true story, at our, at our church, who constantly would say, oh yeah, this week I was watching my son's baseball game, and he would share a story that we had all just read in the most recent Chuck Swindoll book, or you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and we're like, well, that's funny, the same thing happened to Chuck Swindoll, and we had to ask him to stop doing
doing that. So um, using other people's stories is the same as, by the way, in collecting stories, but also collect research uh, articles, because sometimes the articles have really good stories. When I, I, I write books, and uh, my bowling book comes out, and my bowling, not bowling, my bowling book, how do you describe it? Uh, my bullying book comes out, and I use a lot of stories from the research I have. Remember, you can actually sneak me. If you go to our thesourceforparents.com, I actually, if you just scroll down on my website, I have this little section called Offsite Articles Jonathan's Read This Week. Anything I read, I link in there, and you can look and literally read all the articles I've read for the last years upon years, because I'm constantly researching youth culture. So if you're interested in stuff, anything that has anything to do with parents, that the parents would be interested about today's culture, I, I throw on there. Tons of research and stuff. So uh, sometimes we can find good research and stories and stuff like that. Um, also, stories from other messages you hear. If you hear a great story, you think that's a good idea. One, it might trigger a story that you have of your own that's like that, or a story you can use. So I encourage you, look, stories are huge. Uh, they're very powerful, and stories themselves can be used as a talk. Um, the question is, okay, how do we then get to, some of you guys might go, I've got a great story, but I have no idea what to do. Okay, let's talk about how can we make an impact in just a few minutes. What does kind of this message process look like? And no, I'm not going to be able to teach you a semester's worth of biblical preaching in the remaining 12 minutes we have, because we're not going to dare go into lunch. I mean, that's sacred. So, so let's talk about what making an impact looks like. And I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of the process I go through, and then write down if you want one of the best uh, books on talks, even though I have the word preaching in it, is Biblical Preaching by Haddon Robinson. Uh, last name Robinson, first name Haddon, H-A-D-D-O-N. And Biblical Preaching, by far, probably the best book on communication. But making an impact, one of the things I always tell people is figure out what it is you got to say and say it. Okay? So in other words, by saying it is, I'm just asking you, you know, what do you got to say and say it in one compelling statement? If you were there at the tarmac of the airport and this kid was about ready to get on a plane and go, and you wanted one thing to say to them, what is that? In the biblical preaching book, Hannah Ramos will call that the big idea. What is the one big idea? And the crazy thing is you will listen to 20 messages where people walk up and they're like, hey, what's that message about? Oh, uh, I don't know. Sin, there's a funny story about a dog, uh, you know, whatever. And you don't know, and you should be able to walk out and say, wow, that was powerful. What was it about? It was about that Jesus doesn't care about where we've been, but he cares where we're going. You know, what was the pastor? John Moore, you know, whatever. And then, boom, you're just in it. So say it in one compelling statement. Um, let's, let's practice it real quick. Ready? Matthew 7, I mean, some of you guys are, uh, know this passage. This is the old house on the rock. You know, this is my teacher who follows it. It's wise. A person can build a house on solid rock. So the rain comes and torrents and flood waters rise. The wind beat against the house. It will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish like a person who built his house, his house on sand. And when it rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So I want you guys to think about that really quick. And actually, for those who are taking notes and have not think about, how could you summarize what that passage is trying to say in one statement. Write it down. Think about it real quick, and then I'll take some. Uh, I love to hear time again. How can you say that, what that passage is saying, in one statement? So if somebody goes, what you're talking about? And it talks about this. What I'm basically communicating to you is that you should have a 10-second talk that then you could make a two-minute talk if you want, and maybe even make it a 10-minute talk. But you better know the 10-second talk. you got to know the 10-second talk. So who has something, and I know it takes thought, we're going fast, but who has a way to summarize it here? Go, give it a shot. Build a firm foundation or you will fall. Yeah, build a firm foundation or you will sink, you will fall. You will have, yes, music lady. Build your life on Jesus or you will crash. I love it. Build your life on Jesus, you'll crash and burn. Yes? Trials come for everyone. How you react to Jesus will determine how you do it. Good. Trials come for everyone. How you react to Jesus will determine how you do it. Good. Anything else on there? Yes? Uh, be careful where you build your 
Be careful where you build your house. By the way, you guys might want to take notes. We're hearing some good ones here. See, you can start with like a very, you know, uh, uneducated. You can start with a, uh, you should build your house on a rock because it's firm and stuff. All right? You know, see, you can start with that. You probably don't want to sound like that. You got one more idea? Yeah. I, 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 I'd say something like, you know, do you want to have a beach house that claps the one rain or do you want to have more? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe. Look, yeah, draw them in for that. Sure. Um, build your house on the rock of Jesus. Um, obeying God is like building a house on a solid foundation. What happens when you discover that what you have devoted your life to is temporary and can be gone at any moment? By the way, that's the Andy Stanley right there, the question. He always does the question. So, um, um, what happens when you realize that all this is temporary? God is offering you a solid foundation in an unstable, insecure world. So, you open up a passage, you're like, what is this passage saying to people then? What is this passage saying to us? You do good interpretation of that. You then <coughs> say it in one compelling statement. Now, find a story that illustrates that. Um, and share it. Let's see what I've got here. So exercise. Here's what I want you to do. Um, we're going to try a couple of these. That was a good example. We're going to try a couple more just so you guys get an idea of it. But think, I want you guys to think yourselves. When it comes to that house on the rock, you heard a bunch of you know, things right there. Is there a story you have in your life where you kind of built your house on a flimsy foundation? Where you thought, if I do this, this, and this, I'm going to... It's all going to work out good. And it didn't. That might be your personal story. Maybe you heard a good story from someone more than that. And you can tell the story of your friend Hank from Texas, because his name is Hank, who, you know, this happened to, and then you wrap it up with that scripture. Okay, so exercise. Let's have, this is my name, Hank, here. He's from Philadelphia. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let's have you come up with some funny big ideas and just say it. Here's another one. Matthew, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses in life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let's run with endurance. The race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I'm going to give you guys a minute. How can you say that? Take a peek at that for a minute. I tell kids this story all the time because I was going out and we ran this corner in Lake Tahoe was there and I was like, oh, 
and so blue. And my friend turned, and I went off the edge. <laughs> and I grabbed on this tree, and I was hanging and screaming and stuff like that. And my friend comes back and goes, you took your eyes off, didn't you? And I use that, and tell that story. Kids laugh a bunch. And I sit there and say, isn't that funny how so often we get distracted by things in this life that lure us from looking where we know I should be? Share that scripture. Boom. Let's bring it to small groups. Small group questions. What are some of the distractions in your life that are, that, you know, really bad? Da, da, da. Story, scripture, say that compelling statement, you know, what are the distractions keeping us from being focused on, you know? And I mean, and that passage alone is even, uh, can I go back to it now? Oh my God, my eyes are so bad. Hit me at 42 years old. You guys are coming, I'm letting you know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it's just, it, sharing, sharing that and the story, that scripture alone, I love that. You know, fix your, strip off the weight that hinders, fix your eyes on Jesus. I mean, that's almost, you almost, your compelling sense could almost be the verse. You could almost read that verse. I mean, that's a good one right there. So, share a story that illustrates that. And so basically, like, what you're really doing is this process, this biblical preaching, you know, still by the book. Uh, having read a good book. What have you got to say? Say a compelling statement. Share a story that illustrates that. And uh, I mean, you guys, that's the, the curriculum stuff that you buy, that, that's what it is right there. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say here, because we've got a minute left, is memorize it. Memorize it. Uh, has anybody ever told you a joke that was like a big, long story? So there's a pirate, he wants a parrot, he goes in, he's fine for a parrot, but they only have a foul-mouth parrot. So then, okay, so you hear the whole joke, right? You know? You guys want to hear that joke. But anyway, so the thing is, you hear the whole joke, and when you hear it, you go home, and what do you do? You repeat it to a friend, or to your wife, or to your husband, right? Now, some of us can mess it up, right? We mess up the punchline, stuff like that. So maybe it's good to rehearse it at least once, you know? But stories are memorable. The cool thing about using these story talks are you can stand up, share your story, open up your Bible, share the scripture, and say, that's a wrap. Let's go to small groups. Boom! And if you don't have the gift of speaking, you guys, you kept their interest. You said it in a compelling way. What was the topic tonight? Hey, it's about not looking at the distractions and keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. What are some distractions in your life? Let me tell you some distractions in my life. Work. Boom, right? It's there. You know it. Kids most likely walking out tonight. Like, What's he talking about? Distractions. What are distractions in our life? All right, should be fixed on Jesus. And then you can get deep. You can all get into well, what does that actually look like? How do you do that? I mean, and honestly, I've seen people give 45 minute really good, deep, compelling talk that works through this, the, the passage on that and does that. Um, sometimes some very gifted speakers. And for a lot of us, we should learn to read, and this is an easy format we can use. Uh, you guys, I brought some books with me. I'm going to tell you what they are real quick, so if, you, uh, if you're interested. Um, I have got, you can always jump on my Amazon page, uh, because a bunch of stuff there, and like my bullying book is in here, because it doesn't come out until November. Um, so I encourage you to peek at that, and if you want, pre-order that puppy, because uh, that helps me out, and it feeds starving children. Mine. So please do. <laughs> <laughs> have this one. My guess is she's, oh uh, yeah, I see them actually back there. So we've got, I've got a handful of these 10 minute talk books um, there, and those are, whatever they are on Amazon, I'm two bucks cheaper. So I think they're 17 on Amazon, so I think I'm just 15. It's a $25 book in terms of small reflection. Um, I've got Connect, also about connecting with young people. I've got some of those with us. Get Your Teenager Talking, this book has over a thousand questions in it. Um, this is about having the sex talk with today's kids. But don't worry, they aren't at all the part of any message about sex at all in today's culture. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, and then 52 ways to engage the smartphone sex kids. So those last two are parent books that a lot of youth workers uh, really enjoy. I've got that. That's a mentor pack where I discount it for just 50 bucks for all five of those. Realize that book in the last one alone is a $25 book. So if you want to grab that, I've got those until supplies run out. I've also got some books for teenagers here. I've got my teens guys to social media and mobile devices. Who are you friending? What are you posting? Uh, you know, uh, where are you gleaning your self-esteem from? Not relevant at all to today's culture. At the end of each chapter is discussion questions, just like the 
our daily bread for Christian teenagers. <laughs> and uh, guys, I wrote one book just for guys called The Guy's Guide to God, Girls, and the Bloody Pocket, and the title tells it all. Uh, also have a little cheap little book there for five bucks, Sex Matters, and it's about God's plan for sex. And I've got that as a discount as well. Uh, if you got a few minutes, stop by the table. If not, jump on Amazon. You guys, thanks so much. We'll teach you another session. Enjoy your lunch. Appreciate it.